I do want to acknowledge the sort of the variety of different perspectives we've heard so far. We've heard uh, from a mayor, we've heard from three separate federal agencies. Um, and I think it's clear just how much work and how much thought is going into this big challenge of driving good jobs through infrastructure investments. Um, and this is especially true, I think, for the, the work that we're trying to do around uh, building good jobs for people who've been historically shut off from them. And this is something we've heard time and again through this conversation. And we should name specifically racially minoritized communities, LGBTQ plus workers, uh, and women. Um, outside of, and then alongside of this great work happening at the state, federal, and local level, there are hundreds, there's an unbelievable amount of work happening among nonprofits and community-based organizations um, who've, who've been working for decades in many different capacities to drive investment, to drive high-quality employment uh, through our manufacturing and through our built infrastructure. And we've got a great panel again to close us out today. Um, we're hoping that their work will show you how uh, good jobs can be produced through infrastructure investments, um, how this work can manifest in practice, um, and then some of the distance that we still have to travel. Um, I'll go right down the line with introductions, um, then I'll come back to you to provide like, a, little bit more a little bit more granularity on the work that you do. Of course, it's hard to encapsulate it in one 45-minute session. Um, Lark Jackson is Program Director for the National Center of, uh, for Women's Equity and Apprenticeship and Employment, which is a national technical assistance initiative housed within Chicago Women in Trades. Um, we met her briefly on the, on the live feed here. Um, Chicago Women in Trades, we should note, has been a key steward of uh, the funding available through the U.S. Department of Labor for many years uh, under the Women in Apprenticeship and Non-Traditional Occupations funding. Miranda Nelson, second down here, is National Director of Jobs to Move America, which is a national research and advocacy organization dedicated to building policies and public decision making uh, to support good jobs in the manufacturing sector, especially through community benefits agreements, which we'll talk a little bit more about today. Finally, Nancy Luke is Deputy Director of Building Pathways, a nonprofit based in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, de dedicated to the recruitment, the retention, and the advancement uh, of marginalized and underrepresented groups in the union building trades. Um, building Pathways and Chicago Women in Trades, I should mention, um, are both members of the National Task Force on uh, Tradeswomen's Issues, uh, whose work I'm sure we'll hear about today. On the tables throughout the room, too, you can see some of their uh, work products. Um, so I'll go back down the line, starting with you, Lark. Um, just in two minutes or so, just the quick broad strokes before we get into discussion of what your organization's working on, how your work connects to this overall objective of driving good jobs, and worker, po and worker power through our infrastructure investments. I know it's hard to do in two minutes. <laughs> what a challenge. Um, <laughs> all right, thank you, Michael. Um, thank you for New America for having me here, or having Seawit here, and also thank you to uh, Deputy Secretary Sue and Deputy Secretary Trottenberg for their support. So uh, Chicago Women Trades, we've been around since 1981. Um, our local arm, which is based in Chicago, we run our Technical Opportunities Pre-Apprenticeship Program that um, helps give women the foundational skills to enter the unionized building construction trades there. We have our welding program, which often gets women into careers in manufacturing, so we're continuing that work. Um, but we also support tradeswomen retention services. We even have a tradeswomen leadership council because tradeswomen are at the center of our work. Um, and developing their leadership skills is, you know, uh, extremely important to us. Um, in terms of the infrastructure investments, uh, we are a part of the National Task Force for on Tradeswomen's Issues, um, and we have been a part of amplifying, really supporting, and um, finding ways to implement the oh, finding ways to implement the. Um, framework for promoting equity and inclusion for women and people of color working in the trades on publicly funded infrastructure projects. Again, that document is probably on your tables. It contains 10 components um, for making sure that equity is embedded um, in this massive $1.2 trillion infrastructure investments, right? We know that there have to be um, some goals that we set, right? So, so I won't go through all 10 points, but I'll go through um, just three of them really quickly. Um, one of the most important ones is we want at least one half of 1%, so 0.5% of all federal and state funding, um, infrastructure funding, to be devoted to supportive services. And when we're thinking about supportive services, it goes beyond just you know, transportation assistance. It goes beyond just tools and boots. All those things are super important, but we're thinking um, about pre-apprenticeship investment because we know that providing those foundational skills um, through pre-apprenticeship is a strong pipeline for women to, to get into these male-dominated industries. Um, we also uh, advocate within that 10-point framework uh, technical, 
investments in technical assistance to make sure that those job sites that general contractors and subcontractors are running are harassment free, right? And safe environments for women, people of color to really thrive, right? Um, we know one, one thing that Nancy knows, uh, tradeswomen are often, especially tradeswomen of color, are often the last ones hired, first ones fired. And we want to be a part of um, transforming that. So we know technical assistance is super important. Um, the other key third piece that I really want to highlight is community monitoring of um, the goals that we set on these public fund funded projects and monitoring them at least twice a month. Right? So we want to go beyond best efforts, right? and we want to make sure that it's a community stakeholder monitoring system. So not just uh, federal and state um, and local you know, agencies monitoring, but also trades women-led organizations being a part of that monitoring, trades women themselves being a part of that monitoring. Um, so that's just a snippet of some of the work we're doing. We're doing a, a lot more in terms of expanding our pre-apprenticeship, but Thank you for I'll that introduction. It. Yeah. Clearly, line. We'll, we'll, luckily, we'll be yeah. able to get a little more into it, too. Yeah. Miranda, welcome. Thank you again for joining us. Thank, thanks so much for having me. Um, I uh, also want to appreciate uh, Deputy Secretary Sue, who is still in the room for, uh, with us, um, who shouted out Jobs to Move America earlier, um, and our work on, on the New Flyer Community Benefits Agreement. So at uh, Jobs to Move America, we um, think about one piece of the infrastructure workforce in particular, which is actually the manufacturing workforce, which is building lots and lots of equipment that we need to make our infrastructure work. We're you know, build, building buses and building trains and um, building components for all sorts of new green technology. And um, as, um, as Mary Alice said earlier today, that workforce has been really depleted over the years. And while these manufacturing jobs used to be really good union jobs, they're increasingly precarious. They're increasingly done by temp workers, and they're increasingly non-union. Um, and we are really fighting to try to turn that around, <laughs> to make sure that we are manufacturing um, goods in this country and that they are providing good jobs and that there's equitable access to, to those jobs. Um, and one of the tools that we are using to do that is we're taking the concept of community benefits agreements, which were first developed is really a tool to get um, community benefits out of real estate projects um, and bring them to the manufacturing world and say, hey, this is another big development in a, in a community, a factory. Um, can we organize to make sure that those factories are bringing good jobs, that workers have a voice on the job, and that there's equitable access to these jobs and hiring and training programs for them? It's, it's you know really important to draw out too. You know we have a pretty broad. We're talking pretty broadly about the skilled trades here, and it's there's a very clear linkage between the works that Jobs to Move America is doing around electric vehicles and the sort of climate imp implications of our infrastructure investments as well. It's a really interesting point. Uh, Nancy, last but not least. Hi everyone, Nancy Luke from Building Pathways. Um, thank you everyone who has graced the stage already. I was doing a lot of nodding from the audience. <laughs> I was like, yep, that's important. Yep, that's what we're working on too. <laughs> Can't wait to talk to you after. Um, so the key things that we work on are trying to get folks that have traditionally been left out of the building trades, especially union programs, into union programs. We see it as the fastest way to career a good job with benefits, with union protections for folks. If you don't go the college route, even if you go the college route and decide it's not for you, we want to make sure that you, you can not only have um, a job but a career and thrive, right? Um, for us, it's a, we work on a supply and demand model. So we work to make sure like through our pre-apprenticeship program, through our Northeast Center for Trades, Women, Equity, through our Build a Life campaign, um, we have a lot of programs, through um, our Mass Girls in Trade program that we're creating intentional spaces for folks to like learn, grow, and thrive to see that they're not alone, that there's a movement behind them, especially like for the girls, like teenage girls going to a conference where at their school they might be the only in the carpenters program or the only in sheet metal. And then they see that there are hundreds of other girls across the state that are also in these programs and that the tradeswomen come and support them and say like, no, you're part, you're part of the work, you're part of the movement um, is really important. We, we recognize, and people have named it as an issue that sometimes women, people of color, don't 
if they can't see it, they can't see themselves being it, right? So outreach is really important in our communities. Making sure folks are telling their stories is really important in our communities. Creating a space where that once you are in a program, in an apprenticeship program, uh, as a woman, that we have Trade Talk Tuesdays where you can come and support each other. This is what I'm experiencing. What are you experiencing? And then you stay and talk to those career seekers and tell them, like, you know, this is, this is my path. This is how I got into trades. This, this is how you can. We can support you in working through that um, is really important. And then on the demand side, thinking through what policy work, right? Thinking through how do we use city ordinances to move the work in a real way? How do we use infrastructure money? How do we use PLA agreements um, to move the work in a real way? Um, so yeah, that's what we're, in a nutshell, working on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Nancy. And it's, yeah, it's really interesting to hear that specific, you know, that specific strategy. And one of the things, um, my colleague Taylor White mentioned some of the work that our team has done recently around inclusion in the skilled trades, especially with focus on youth. And we've mm -hmm. heard about the importance of looking at both that sort of bottom up from the worker level perspective, empowering workers, and then also driving structural change from the top. Um, so hopefully we can get a little bit into that. Um, today we've already heard um, a bit about the types of strategies that you've worked on. I think you know, the, the sort of big models that we're hearing from your organizations, big topics of conversation already in our discussions today. I mean, we've talked about apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship as racial and gender inclusion strategies. We've talked about community benefits agreements. We've heard about the importance of childcare for working and learning parents. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important to recognize, and we've already acknowledged it today, um, about these different models is that they've actually been around for quite a long time. These different types of work have been going on a long time. CBAs have been uh, around 20 or 25 years, depending on which you count as the first. Um, there was a goal for 6.9% of all federally funded contracting hours uh, to be performed by women, set in 1978 in the Carter administration. Um, the, uh, there's a, a printout on the tables here about uh, child care for apprentices. And the Oregon uh, Department of Transportation, who unfortunately couldn't be here with us today, um, have provided a $2,500 per month per child subsidy for child care since 2010. So these are, these are pieces, these are you know, efforts that have been around for quite a long time. And I wanted to ask you, and I'll start with you, Miranda, based on your experience working on these strategies, as you've done your work over the past few years, and we've started to have more and more conversations about job quality, uh, about inclusion, about worker power in construction and manufacturing, what progress have you, have you seen? Um, and I can ask you more specific questions, but as a, as a general sort of sense, have we seen a lot of progress in the past few years? Well, I think, I think for us at Jobs to Move America, we absolutely have. Um, we have really focused on getting community benefits agreements in the uh, electric bus industry. There's, there's five companies in the electric bus industry. We now have community benefits agreements at three of them. And a fourth company uh, is already providing good, good union jobs, so we um, didn't focus on that one. Uh, so that's, that's, we think, a really good, really good setting for the industry, right? And we really think about that in kind of contrast to the electric car industry in, in our country, which um, is not, uh, is largely becoming a low road industry. We have tons of different non-union factories opening up. And, um, and we're, you know, while it's incredibly important to transition our, our cars off of fossil fuels, um, the further investments in the Inflation Reduction Act are going to continue to go to these non-union companies unless we do something about it. Um, one reason that we've been able to drive so much change in the electric bus industry is because of government intervention. Uh, this is an industry that is pretty much exclusively selling to government agencies. <laughs> and so government has, so we have worked with a variety of, of government agencies to demand real standards in their contracts and make sure that when they are contracting that they are asking what kinds of wages and benefits are you paying and rewarding companies that are paying good wages and benefits and rewarding companies that want to really invest in, in hiring and training programs. Um, we, uh, we, without that kind of government investment and government levers, it would be so much harder for us to, to do this job. And you know, I think that's really true of CBAs overall. A lot of the big successful ones in real estate development happen because real estate development needed something from, from the government, right? Whether it was a rezoning or some sort of investment. And, and so I think that, that pairing of um, the organizing the ground and the organizing of community organizations and unions with, um, with real government 
power to, to drive up these standards, I think, is, is a real key to, to success. And I, don't, I wonder if I could just ask another yeah. question about that sort of coalition building that you mentioned. You know, everybody who we've got in the room today, everybody who's watching online, obviously are interested in the workforce development aspects of this discussion. They're interested in technology. They're interested in, in labor organizing. They're, everybody else is all, we're also members of communities ourselves. So we've got communities that we live in that are going to benefit from infrastructure investments over the next few years. How do, how do we do a good job as neighbors? of organizing in our communities to make sure that these infrastructure dollars go to support, go to support good things for our, for our neighbors and for our communities? Well, I think it's, it's really important um, to be really intentional about who we're organizing and make sure that a variety of groups have, have a seat at the table. Um, in, uh, in the coalition we built in, in Alabama, where the, the, new, factor, the new flyer factory is, is located, um, we, we brought together groups that kind of ran the gamut from, from labor unions to environmental groups to religious groups to, uh, to groups that were focused on, on the workforce. Um, and I think having all those perspectives at the table really, really helped us to, to push forward and to win. Um, and the other really important thing, um, and is, is one that our, our executive director, Marilyn Janice, always highlights, is that we, we shouldn't settle. <laughs> we should make big demands, and we should be trying to win the big demands so that everyone can really benefit from, from community, from investment in, in our communities. And, and so like don't, at, when we were negotiating our, our new flyer CBA, there were a couple of times when, uh, when the company offered something that was uh, good for labor unions, but not for the community. And then there were times that they offered something that was good for the community and not for, not for workers. And so there was a real understanding among the coalition that if we hung together, um, that we could uh, get something that could be good for everyone, and that is what we eventually got. Um, and, and so I think really being able to build strong organizations that stand in solidarity with each other is, is important. We're, we're a little bit behind time, and I, I wanted to talk about this, but I think maybe I'll just let the audience know that uh, Jobs to Move America has some really fantastic resources, almost sort of toolkit, cookbook type things for building CBAs, and it's the US Employment Plan and I think there are some other toolkits available through your website too to talk about. Sort yeah, of. yeah. So the, on on our website, you can read all about the U.S. Employment Plan, which is the tool that we try to get um, agencies to adopt when they're buying these these manufactured goods, um, where they look at wages and benefits and really reward companies that are that are doing good things. Um, and then we talk about how to organize in, in community together to to negotiate CBAs like like the ones we have. Um, we really see them as paired. As I said, we need the government levers to get to the good community benefits. And such a huge part of some of the great CBAs that we've seen, of course, is apprenticeship training. Apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship as a way to connect neighbors and residents to good jobs. Um, so Lark, Nancy, I want to ask both of you, just because you're both doing so much work on, on apprenticeship and other work-based learning pathways, um, how have you seen work-based learning models serving the communities where you've implemented them? What have been, the, what have been sort of the tangible outputs there? I guess I start. Um, so, you know, Chicago Women in Trades, I talked a lot about, um, or earlier I mentioned that we've been around since 1981. That's locally in Chicago. Our national center, which I'm a part of, we've been around since 2016, and we've really focused on, you know, seeding programs nationally, um, seeding pre-apprenticeship programs nationally, providing that technical assistance to industry stakeholders nationally. So, um, one initiative that I want to highlight um, is the Women in Non-Traditional Careers Initiative located in Philly. Um, it's a multi-stakeholder collaboration um, that seeks to uh, increase the numbers of women in the skilled construction, manufacturing, transit, and um, utilities industries. Um, and so I remember four years ago when we you know, were literally you know, all meeting in the Philadelphia Workforce Board's um, conference room. It was maybe 20 of us. Um, fast forward, you know, four years, we have a mailing list of over 600 people. We now have, um, we finished our second cohort of a tradeswomen readiness program. And those women um, are entering careers in the, uh, the unionized construction trades in Philadelphia, right? We also developed a mentorship uh, program to accompany that um, tradeswomen readiness program. So every trainee was paired with, was, was paired with a current um, Philadelphia area tradeswoman, right? So just think about how um, that support helps, right, a prospective tradeswoman. Think about 
the um, uh, support that they, I, I think about the support that they were able to get through supportive services. So like work boots, tools, um, career guidance, right? Um, career outreach, career education. Um, so, so much of the problem that I see is on the, you know, at the very like baseline level, it's just like lack of career education and outreach. Mm -hmm. Like you would be shocked at like how many um, women, you know, um, who come up to me and it's like, if only I had known about this career opportunity when I was 18, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or I've been taking toasters apart my whole life where I've been, you know, um, dismantling equipment, you know, just for fun. I didn't realize that there was a skill set associated with that, right? Um, and so I say all that to say, um, really the investment in pre-apprenticeship, um, special shout out to the Women's Bureau and the WANTO grant that's allowed us to to build that um, multi-stakeholder collaboration, to build that programming, um, you know, that's the that's the type of progress that we're seeing nationally. Um, locally in Chicago, we uh, just launched or just finished, sorry, our first uh, mill rights class with the Carpenters in Chicago, women only pre-apprenticeship program. We are launching a women only pre-apprenticeship program with the iron workers locally in Chicago. We are building a, um, a national mentorship model. Um, with the bricklayers and allied craft, work, craft workers and also the Iron Workers International Union. So, you know, I've been able to see these things slowly build and obviously, you know, um, uh, as an organization, we've been able to, you know, see these victories, but I think we're just at this, like, really momentous moment, not only with the infrastructure investments, but just with the desire to have pre-apprenticeship programs um, from registered apprenticeship programs, like, coming to us and want to collaborate. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think there I have a couple of things, I think reflections just come from that. But I wanted to, to Nancy, I think just ask you the question we discussed a little bit before the, the presentation. You know, we were talking a lot about, um, you know, how we get women into, into skilled trades occupations. And it's so, so important because I think this is a statistic from uh, here to stay from your report, your recent paper. report, yeah, yeah. which I couldn't print out. We ran out of paper, apologies. Um, <laughs> There's, there's tremendous progress recently getting uh, women into skilled trades. Still only 3%, 3.5%, I think, of the, of the construction workforce. Um, Nancy, when you're thinking about uh, you know, the goal of getting more women into the trades, how does that connect in with a, with a racial justice agenda in infrastructure investments as well? Right. Um, so we're seeing that while all our efforts to make sure that women know that it's possible to be in the trades, there are pre-apprenticeship programs like Building Pathways that will help you and support you, that there's um, the Northeast Center for Trades Women Equity that will help and support you. It's also about what you're experiencing on the job site. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, like the culture, we still need, have a lot of work to do on shifting the culture of job sites. So for us um, at Building Pathways, we're working with a new, we're working with Oregon's tr Trades Women um, to work on Rise Up, which is like a respectful workplace Made, made and designed by the construction industry for the construction industry to address these issues. And then also having the intentional spaces of groups like, um, like the Tradeswomen Tuesdays for folks to talk about what they're experiencing so that we can address it. For, for, for spaces for like um, the policy group on tradeswomen issues to talk about what's, like in that space there are stakeholders from the construction industry, the tradeswomen, um, like um, government to hear and reflect on this is what's going on, what can we do? Like how could you help us in shifting it? So that's what we're seeing in, um, as a struggle and, and ways to overcome that struggle. And so thank you so much for sharing that. I think one of the things that struck me, I think from, from the work of Chicago Women Trades and from the work of Building Pathways, and again, you, you know, it seems like you collaborate a lot in really important ways, um, you know, that there's a, sort of an effort to help women and help communities, especially women of color, sort of see themselves in skilled trades occupations. Absolutely. And then there's also work of getting through it. Once you see yeah. yourself in it, persisting in it, which is just as important, it seems, because it can even go awry if you've, you know, if you've started in it, but it doesn't work out well. Um, I want to stick to, I think, this sort of, you know, we've, I really appreciate you all diving in. Again, I'm sorry, we're a little bit behind time. Um, I do want to encourage everyone in person and online to be thinking about questions. There is an online chat function you can submit. I promise we'll get to them as soon as we can. Um, but we've talked today a lot about strategies that work. 
Um, that's been, I think, the main focus of our, of our discussion. Um, things that were optimistic will work, things that we're pretty sure will work. Um, Deputy Secretary Sue mentioned the importance of keeping a clear-eyed view. Deputy Secretary Trottenberg talked about uh, expanding our view of what's possible, what's feasible uh, in our work around good jobs. Um, and it's, impor it's important to be honest, too, about the things that haven't worked or the things that haven't worked quite yet. Um, and I wanted to save a little bit of time just to talk about those things briefly. And we've already sort of touched on some of them in discussion, but maybe just sticking with it on the apprenticeship side, the apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship side, um, we know that it can be extremely, extremely difficult um, to make construction work sites safe and welcoming, uh, especially for women, for LGBTQ plus populations, and for people of color. What still needs to happen if we're going to fully dismantle these structures of gender and racial equality on construction work sites and on manufacturing work sites in this country? And this is a big question. Right. I let you know it was coming. <laughs> yes, you did. You did. You did. <laughs> I, I, have some, I have some suggestions. I think, um, you know, we talked about federal money, right, that's coming to the states and what's being written in and required. And so requiring um, programs and, and cultural change like rise up, having stuff written in for child care and what that looks like. Having stuff written in even for like pumping stations, I know like people don't think of that, but like, you know, new moms coming back to work um, are thinking about that, like where am I going to pump? And should I still be, am I still going to be able to pump? Um, I think that like the cultural shift will happen when we are not only doing the curriculum and doing the respectful workplace trainings, but there are like, there's some type of way for there to be accountability, right? Like if you're not meeting these goals for um, women, people of color on the job, what, what happens? Mm -hmm. If you're not creating a respectful workplace, what happens, you know? Um, because then it gives teeth to the legislation, gives teeth to the policy um, for us to really try to push for women to be like, no, it is a good job. No, you'll be respected. No, you, should, you will stay and thrive. So. Anything you'd like to add, Lark? I, really, I like the idea that sort of, you know, we're talking a lot about enforcement and monitoring, too. I think that's obviously an important sort of part to consider. Sorry, Lark. Yep, you're great. Um, I agree with everything that Nancy <laughs> said. Um, I would even add, like, uh, just one piece of, you know, better collaboration between like groups um, and the OFCCP, right? Just making sure that, again, things have teeth. Um, and again, I'm just, I wanna kinda think about the micro, like, you know, community-based level. Like, I, investments in technical assistance is so essential, mm -hmm. right? Um, and making sure that, like one thing, for instance, that CWID does is that, you know, for our like bystander intervention training or our sexual harassment prevention training, like we, um, you know, we encourage and oftentimes require um, leadership to attend those trainings, right? Mm -hmm. We provide train the trainer, um, a train and trainer piece for them as well, so that they know how to also administer those trainings. Um, technical assistance has to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has to be valued, right? It has to be invested in because that is also gonna like really change the culture shift. In addition to those, that teeth, right? There also has to be that other side of like, training on how to provide like, you know, just health and safety for women in construction, for instance. Um, and yeah, I think I'll leave it there. But I just, yeah, if and, you wanna. Yeah, and I mean, it's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, well, yeah. No, I agree. Down. I agree with what Lark said. Like, I think that's why it's important that all levels of construction from the workers mm -hmm. to the owners are all held accountable and all, all trained up and respectful work sites. Um, and I also think, like, I, I know it came up about, like, thinking about barriers. What are the barriers that would prevent women, moms, single moms from participating? I don't think it, it can be an afterthought. I think it has to be very intentional as well. So when we look at childcare, we're looking at, um, like, we sit on the task force, right, that's trying to address childcare, so, like, um, care that works. So we're looking at non-traditional hours. We're looking at how expensive it is. The most expensive state is Massachusetts for childcare. And thinking of like, how can we reduce those barriers? But if we're looking at it and we're doing a pilot program, how can we push the construction industry to look at it with us? How can we push them to put money behind it? How can we put, push like money to be written in for infrastructure for that? And also, um, like the mayor um, from Minnesota said, 
um, Rochester, Minnesota, um, said that it also has to be like a good sustaining career. So we're also at the table thinking of that because it impacts can women participate in our program if this doesn't exist. So. And some wonderful points about technical assistance. And I wanted to just highlight a resource from you all. Um, it's the, the finishing the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So great resource, and this, you know, I think it resonates with us, you know, thinking about youth apprenticeship, we think about different stakeholder communities that you have to engage in different ways. Um, you've got this resource which has basically six different sort of, I think it's six different sort of targets. So for, uh, for managers, for uh, frontline supervisors, for subcontractors, for city government, you know, different ways to provide sort of an, an equity framework and to drive equity through construction, in construction work sites. Yeah, and I think it's been mentioned from everyone that everyone that's been on the stage, it's gonna take us all. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, from where I sit in the community, what can I do to drive this forward? And so then, oh, you don't, you don't know? We, we have a manual for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, sure. I just also, um, just really thinking about the, the lens of like women of color in the trades. Um, so the Here to Stay briefing paper at the very end has um, a list of uh, like 10 recommendations. And one that, you know, as I speak with register, construction registered apprenticeship programs in particular, and I'm, you know, walking them through these recommendations, one that, that like, I can almost see like a light bulb go off is like um, our recommendation that you have an ombudsperson. So like an, mm -hmm. like an intermediary person, right, who can help, um, you know, help that woman of color on, you know, navigate any challenges she may be experiencing on a job site or within her apprenticeship program, right? And it, it seems like on the surface so, you know, such a simple idea, but it's, you know, I think just us having the ability to provide these recommendations, to provide this technical assistance, I've seen it really be helpful because you do see those light bulbs go off. You do see people start resonating, right? Oh, that is an option, right? And yeah, it sounds like a, a long-term project. It's a lot of different sort of, uh, you know, areas of technical assistance, types of education and yeah. learning. Um, Miranda, I don't want to give short, shri short shrift to CBAs. Um, just, you know, as, as quickly as we can, you know, JMA and a coalition of your national partners has been uh, really successful in building locally and economically targeted hiring into the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is a huge, huge victory. Um, there are still state and federal regulations that keep federal expenditures from doing as much as they can uh, to support communities and local workers, including union workers, through infrastructure investments and procurement. Um, when you're thinking about what's next for CBAs, where are you thinking? Yeah, so that is a a huge point of concern for us. Um, so these federal regulations for a long time um, made it impossible for cities and states to use federal money and hire locally within their communities. Uh, we changed that in the infrastructure bill uh, for construction jobs funded through the Department of Transportation, which is a great first step. But the infrastructure bill just itself funds huge investments in broadband and water and sewer infrastructure and there's Still, these federal regulations are still blocking the ability to do local and economically targeted hire um, in, on those programs, which we see as, as a huge problem. And so we're really fighting to, to change those regulations um, to really open up the ability for cities and states to do the kinds of in building in of incentives that we, we've been talking about uh, to make it easier for um, our communities to win community benefits from this. Thank you so much. Um, we have very little time remaining, but I know there have probably been a lot of great questions that have come to mind from our fantastic panelists. Does anybody have a quick one? <laughs> this is a tall order, I know. <laughs> um, hi, all. Uh, someone earlier made a point um, that we do a really bad job with career education, um, just broadly, but as it applies to this panel in particular. Um, I agree, I used to be a high school teacher, so I've got that perspective. Um, I'm now on the community college team here at New America. Um, but I'm just wondering from you all, like, where should that burden of career education lie? Um, it feels like, like your groups in a lot of ways are picking up the pieces of like, a system that doesn't do that well. Um, so I'm just kind of curious of any, any thoughts there. Everyone. <laughs> That's my answer. It should lie with everyone. I think, um, you know, when we talk to guidance counselors or when they come, like our Mass Girls in Trades conference is, is specifically for juniors and seniors in high school, right? As they're thinking of like, what's next for me? And for some folks, it's not college. And so for it's not college, does that mean we stop talking to them or we don't find what their career could look like or, or what their life's gonna look like after high school? For us, it's no, right? And so um, thinking about 
for girls that are in like career tech high schools, making sure they know that there are good union jobs out there that you can be a part of. Um, and so like the, the guidance counselors that come sometimes aren't the ones that are working directly with them. And so we're educating them too, like if you have anyone else that you think of. Or if it's, you know, for youth that are not involved in any type of program, right? The 18 to 24 year olds that are not engaged in stuff, but they're like, you know, they were um, returning citizens or engaged in the justice system. Who's talking to you about what's next for you? If we're, if we're thinking about, um, everyone. <laughs> we're thinking about traditional high schools too, right? I don't, I'm, I'm very much about like, you know, like if we want to uplift the community and we want to make sure we're reaching as much of the community as possible, and how do we do that? And so, like you said, Michael, like we're all part of a community, and if it's like, you know, announcements at the church bulletin, if it's flyers at different community centers, just thinking about how we're making sure that everyone is thriving in our community. I'll quickly add to that. Agreed. And one example I can give you is actually the Philadelphia Workforce Board. They actually have on their website a tab for the Women in Non-Traditional Careers Initiative. So it's not just, hey, you know, we're, we just need people to find jobs. It's like, no, this is actually a hub for Philadelphia area prospective tradeswomen to really do a self-assessment to figure out if, you know, one of these non-traditional male-dominated career pathways is for them. It's for them to hear tradeswomen stories. We have a Today's Rosie podcast on that, um, on that website, on that, that tab. Um, and I, again, special shout out to Philadelphia Works. Like they have taken such a, a massive leadership role in the career education and outreach piece. Um, and I agree, like one, one thing that CWID does um, when we do trainings on outreach and recruitment, like best practices in outreach and recruitment, is we also um, work with uh, construction and, and not just construction, but registered apprenticeship programs. Um, to train them how to, how to use CBOs to do their outreach and recruitment, right? How do you educate them about your trade, right? How do you actually, um, you know, give them the, the, the facts of your trade, give them the, the benefits of your trade, right, so that they can work with their community and essentially be your recruiters, right? Because <laughs> recruitment is a lot of work, but, it, but it's, it's so important. So agreed, it has to be a community effort, it has to be multi-stakeholder. Um, because you're just going to reach such a diverse talent pool that way, mm -hmm. right? Thank you. Miranda, any last words? No, I'm just no? <laughs> very inspired by the work of my co-panelists. And very inspired by you. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Folks, I'm afraid we are just out of time. Um, I think we could spend a whole day, a whole week on this topic, <laughs> obviously. Um, I want to acknowledge the uh, massive amount of uh, so, you know, support that we have for this effort in communities across this country. It's hundreds of practitioners. Um, I think it should inspire excitement and resolve for what's possible, what needs to be done um, to build our, you know, revitalize our built infrastructure, secure our climate future, secure the future of work for American workers across the country. I want to thank the 200 or so people who joined us online and to all of you who joined us in person uh, in the audience, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, before I turn it back to the founder and senior director of New America's Center in Education and Labor, Mary Alice McCarthy, um, I want to thank our three panelists, Clark Jackson, Miranda Nelson, Nancy Luke, uh, for joining us today, for sharing your experience and your expertise. And I wonder if I could ask you to join me in a round of applause.